Thank you everyone for coming to the Project on Government Oversight's Town Hall on the Cost of Police Misconduct Act. Um, we have two very distinguished members of Congress here today um, to give opening remarks and then a great panel coming up. Um, so let's get right into the program. Our first speaker uh, is Congressman Don Beyer. He represents the 8th District of Virginia. Um, he's the chairman of Congress's Joint Economic Committee, um, longtime small business owner, former ambassador, former Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, and um, is the person who came up with the idea for this bill. Um, so please uh, go ahead, Representative Beyer. Catherine, thank you very much. And um, it's an overstatement to say that I came up with the bill. Uh, <laughs> or maybe uh, yeah, in my role last year as the vice chair of the Joint Economic <laughs> Committee, uh, we were doing um, driven by the pandemic, uh, calls with the smartest economists we could find across the country, asking them what we should do next. And uh, when the George Floyd incident happened, inevitably we ended up talking about policing. And one of them said, you know, you, you, do you have any idea what police misconduct costs? And that was really the idea. But I'm thrilled to be on here with Senator Kane, one of the men in, in America I most admire and respect, who has held not just virtually every elective office, but has been um, beloved and respected and esteemed in every different job that he's had, going all the way back to civil rights lawyer and the like. And it's a it's a great honor for me to get to do this bill with Senator Kane. And I'm just thrilled to be part of POGO too, the government oversight. What a cool idea. <laughs> we're, we're all for it. <laughs> so, so in trying to think, Catherine, about how to open this, I remembered uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's on being in nothingness, where he talks about the keyhole experiment that when you're sitting, kneeling down at a door, looking through the keyhole at people in the other room, you have one feeling. But when someone walks by and notices you looking through the keyhole, all of a sudden, your perspective changes completely. You have shame, you have humiliation, you have self-consciousness, you have the sense of the other, which is why Sartre rolled it out there. But that's exactly the idea of this bill, that we have hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of dollars being spent uh, to settle cases based on police misconduct that we don't know about, that essentially state and local governments are the ones at the keyhole. And if we walk by and notice it and talk about it, um, it's going to change that behavior. Um, I am a physics nerd. I get to serve on the science committee. And one of my uh, favorite physics ideas um, is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which simply says, if you measure anything, you change it automatically. Journalists all appreciate this. Once you write about something, you've changed it. And we think that once we measure the cost of police misconduct, that we will change it. Um, you know, it's uh, all you have to do, I think, is roll out what Fairfax County, Virginia, or the city of Chicago, or LA spends on police misconduct, and the taxpayers know about it, and things will happen. We tend to spend the money in three ways. Number one, the insurance premiums which are gonna go up when their insurance pay claims paid off. Second, out of the general fund of cities and counties and, and states. And then the third is sort of the most interesting, which are uh, the bonds, where we literally have had local and state governments going to Wall Street to borrow money to pay off police misconduct claims. Um, they, they, on Wall Street, they're apparently called police misconduct bonds. Um, so just think about the impacts on tax rates, on local services, money that could be invested in police salaries and training and equipment rather than in paying off. And, and the thing that I think Senator Kane and I are most excited about is this could be, should be, will be a bipartisan effort because our Republican friends like to save money. They don't want to have excess government spending and this makes good sense. Um, you know, we've had to defend ourselves against charges of uh, defunding the police um, this is the exact opposite of that. We're trying to defund police misconduct so we can renew our commitment to the overwhelming majority of good cops that are out there. There's much, much more that I could say about this, but I, I would uh, want to leave uh, many different things to my, my dear friend, Senator Kane, and would yield to him, Catherine, but yield you to introduce him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so our next speaker, um, Everyone knows he's a, one of Virginia's senators, um, former vice presidential nominee. Um, I 
Not everyone may know that he began his career as a civil rights lawyer in Richmond, Virginia, and he eventually became city councilor, mayor of Richmond, and lieutenant governor and governor of Virginia. Um, so, Senator Kane. Great. Well, thank you, Catherine, and to all with the uh, Project on Government Oversight. And I just want to say how much fun it is to work on this bill with Don. He was modest. I mean, this really is his idea based on the insights that he described. And, and he's right. If we if we shine a spotlight on this, then we're going to get better at it. Um, uh, um, it was either Thomas Jefferson or Louis Brandeis who said sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, and that's just a, a watchword for everybody in the government oversight business. You know, I approach this um, as somebody who kind of has a has a foot in a couple of different camps. I was a civil rights lawyer for 17 years, primarily battling housing discrimination, but, but certainly uh, took on many, many cases against local governments for discriminatory activities. I never had a police misconduct case, but I had all kinds of voting rights or unlawful termination cases. And I got some really big settlements from local governments, but oftentimes those settlements, if, if it was truly a settlement, not a jury verdict, it kind of gets hidden. And, you know, everyday citizens, journalists, even local officials may or may not know completely the terms of the settlement and the degree to which misconduct has cost for them. But in addition to being a civil rights lawyer, I've also been a mayor and governor with some supervisory responsibility over police forces. And I worked very, very closely with the, the Richmond police force at a very tough time where our city was number two in the country per capita homicides. And I saw my police do novel community policing strategies that eventually over the years brought our homicide and aggravated assault rates down dramatically. Um, and similarly, at the state level, when I worked with our Virginia State Police, during the time I was governor, we achieved something that we, I don't think we had ever achieved, which is we became in serious crime data, one of America's 10 safest states. And a lot of that was because of very, very good police work. So look, I value high quality police work and I abhor police misconduct. And I wanna make sure that if there is misconduct, we we, you know, eliminate a root and branches, as, as they would say. Um, when we measure things, we get better. Um, here's um, uh, a good news story. And, the, and the, the gist that I'm giving you is current as of at least about six months ago. I haven't checked it so recently. But if you look at the police deaths in duty in this country, they've gone down pretty dramatically in the last 30 years, particularly in a growing nation. And that's because we measure them very, very carefully. We measure them at local level, state level, we measure them at the federal level. I often have come to Washington over Mother's Day weekend when we, we normally have a police memorial uh, commemoration uh, here in DC, and I've done this before. And any single death in any year is a tragedy, but looking at the trend, we started to measure it and focus on it. And because of that, we managed it. And, police deaths in, in duty have significantly reduced. What a cause for celebration. We don't do the same thing with deaths of individuals in police custody. Even though there have been some mandates over the years that that data be collected and reported, it really hasn't been. And so it's had to be publications like the Washington Post and others who've had to kind of recreate the data. Well, sadly, when you're, you're not collecting the data uh, and you're not um, putting it out there public, then you don't have a way to manage it to try to get to a better result. Um, I, I noticed that about a year ago that we had had a real differential in the way we were treating deaths of police and deaths of people in police custody. We should analyze it all, publicize it all, manage it all so that both go down to as near zero as possible. This bill that Don has proposed is basically doing that. Um, if we don't have an easy way to understand the cost to taxpayers of police misconduct, then um, policymakers will not make the decisions that they should because they're not even armed with the information they need to try to better um, uh, reduce and then eliminate police misconduct. So this kind of simple transparency measure, which should be popular to all, what, what member of the press or citizen doesn't feel like they have the right to know something? We all feel like we have the right to know something and we do. Um, and if we can make the information about these settlements, I mean, just a couple of things, we could go on with the data for hours, but 
Last year, Prince George County paid $20 million in one case to the family of a handcuffed man who was killed by police officers. Washington paid $40 million to victims of police abuse just between 2016 and 2020. And Richmond, my city, has paid nearly a million dollars in the last 10 years. Um, and these are just three communities. You, you aggregate that up city by county, state by state, year after year. And the taxpayers are just footing this enormous cost. We can do better. And uh, Don's bill, which I'm pleased to be the sponsor of on the Senate side, will enable us to do better. Thanks so much. Um, and so uh, one question um, for either of you, but probably first to uh, Representative Beyer. Um, can you walk through in a little more detail exactly what the bill does? Um, sure. Yeah. Well, the, the first thing it does is it creates um, a national police misconduct registry. No, no, it could, actually it doesn't do that. Um, <laughs> that's what the George Floyd bill does. Yeah. <laughs> one of the key, key differences is we're not measuring it by officer. So there's no mm -hmm. personally identifiable information. We're just looking at the dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and then we we'll figure the George Floyd thing, which after Senator Kane gets it through the Senate, will handle the, the individual stuff. <laughs> This will keep you know a bad cop from going to, to office to office, but mm -hmm. also the attorney general it creates an online searchable database of the information. So if you miss the story in the newspaper, you can go back and look it up. Uh, the controller general, comptroller general, is supposed to conduct a study every year for the leading cause of such judgments. So there is actually some analysis, some some mm -hmm. data deep dive to say not just here it is, but here's what's causing it. And then something that doesn't seem directly related to this, but you know, we actually have, uh, uh, when you try to figure out how many federal agencies have law enforcement authority, um, the Department of Justice um, Inspector General report recently said, we have no idea. <laughs> so, so it says for the first time, it, it asked the Attorney General to determine the number of federal agencies that have law enforcement authority and make that information personally available also. So there's a couple of, ancillary things that go to support the overall work of making this data public. Mm -hmm. And since uh, law enforcement is, and, you know, the federal government, I guess, has trouble calculating its own law enforcement agencies. And then, of course, there are many, many more state and local uh, law enforcement departments. So how does the bill um, incentivize states and local governments to report the data? Well, it, um, it actually doesn't so much incentivize it, it actually requires it, <laughs> well, that's um, which, which, which is sort of easier. You know, on things like the No Hate Act, which Governor or the President signed last week, we mm -hmm. actually put money on the table to upgrade the, the software systems of all these local governments. And um, we use much more of a carrot. But, but here, um, the, the data is already there. It's just a matter of reporting. So. Mm -hmm. um, and Senator Kane, I wanted to speak to you. Have you um, have you been in touch with uh, Senator Booker and Senator Scott about um, both this bill and policing reform more generally? Um, I, I have, Catherine, and you know, Rep. Congressman Byer said when Kane gets it out of the Senate, um, it, it's, a, it's a it's a negotiating um, very much in in the process of negotiation right now. I'm not on the Judiciary Committee where the police reform bills go, but Senators Booker and Scott are considering their own bills. I have this bill and one other uh, dealing with putting limitations on the use of tear gas, which I think is now being used in, in indiscriminate ways against peaceful populations. And that, that I think that should be part of a police reform bill too. So I'm talking to both of them again about these proposals. I would say of the two, I'll be blunt, the one that is more likely to immediately get um, Republicans on board is is the buyer bill because as he points out nobody wants to see you know government money spent unwisely and if we can manage down these uh, lawsuit costs by getting better in our practices why wouldn't we do it so I uh, we are having these discussions I I know that there is real effort uh, kind of spurred on by Chairman Durbin on judiciary to get <coughs> Tim Scott and Cory Booker's bills with the other ideas that are surrounding them into a place where we could do something bipartisan. You know, sadly, the anniversary of George Floyd's death is tomorrow. And um, we hoped that we might have a product ready for prime time, if not passed by tomorrow. And that 
is probably not going to happen. But but the discussions are still going on and the reports are they're getting closer and closer. I think qualified immunity, how to reform qualified immunity or whether to reform it continues to be a tough piece of it. But I think some progress is being made. And this bill just seems so eminently sensible that I, I, if we can get a bill, I think this will be in the bill. <laughs> and Catherine, one, one sort of process addition, because I know you have people who understand government very well. Um, when the George Floyd Justice and Policing Bill went through the House, it was not open for amendments, our so-called closed rule. So we couldn't add it. But I think, you know, Senator Kane and I are both aware that uh, it's the rare bill that goes through by itself. <laughs> you know, right. they tend to get packed in this b big, important vote. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for my friend, Senator Cain, to get it added to the George Floyd buses bill. So, uh, and by the way, yeah, politics is the art of the possible. I mean, we think we have a really pretty good bill here, but, um, you know, we're not rigid about it. If there's ways that Republicans can improve it and make it pass, we're for that. Um. And I wanted to ask you both, I, I think um, the idea of the bill isn't to discourage uh, cities and states from settling claims as much as it is to um, incentivize them to make sure their police departments aren't committing the misconduct in the first place. Am I correct about that? Absolutely. Yeah, the, this is not to discourage settlements, you know, the, Usually you have a city attorney advising the city, okay, here's our chances on liability. This case doesn't look good. Smartest thing to do is settle. And if that's the case and, and, a, and a settlement will be acceptable to the victim's family or the victim and their attorney, um, and a city thinks that the settlement might be better than running the risk of going to trial, that might be the prudent thing to do. But we shouldn't obscure that information from the public as as Don said, this isn't about individual officers. It's just if the if the city uh, residents in Richmond, for example, understand the size of these cases, then they and the mayor and others and candidates for office are going to be asked, what are you going to do to bring down misconduct? There's a comment in the comment section that I'm watching as we're talking. One way to reduce costs of police misconduct is, be is to better practices by police. So these numbers go down. Absolutely. But the numbers um, being made public are a forcing mechanism to accomplish just that end. And that's why making this data public is likely to have the kind of therapeutic effect that uh, Richard in the comment room uh, hopes would happen. And, and Catherine, one addition, because that, you know, that question did come up as we put this together. At least one of the advocacy groups said, hey, we're not sure we're for this if this means that um, we won't get settlements. Um, However, after a lot of discussion, they thought, well, that may occasionally be the case, but the upside is much greater than the downside. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting that um, Representative Byer, you, you touched on how uh, settlements do tend to be paid. Um, and if you could speak a little bit more about what you know about that, you mentioned the general fund, which is the regular city budget. Um, insurance policies, which um, I know that doctors and lawyers have insurance policies. I think people don't necessarily think about police departments having them. And then um, bond revenues. Can you say a little bit more about how each of those work? Well, Catherine, that's it is good that you asked that because we're hoping that in the course of collecting this data, we'll be able to segregate them into the di different pieces. That economist, uh, and I apologize for not remembering her name, but she was obviously very smart. I uh, had <laughs> recently brought this to us and said, do you guys know about those police misconduct bonds on Wall Street? Um, that's what that's what um, really brought it to our attention. So I, I don't know what the breakout's gonna be. We do know as, as you know, Senator Kane was a distinguished attorney for years, almost every organization has to have uh, directors and officers insurance for liability. So I'm sure most state and local governments have to have the same kinds of things, or they decide to self-insure um, for these things like police misconduct. Okay. Um, we have a, a question from the um, chat that I wanted to ask you as well. It's a, it's, Will this bill require reporting on settlements of state causes of action? 
as well as federal ones. We certainly want it to. Yeah, I mean, Don, how, how about in the draftsmanship of it? It is, it, you know, any sort of police misconduct claim, whether it's a federal cause of action or a state cause of action. Yeah, yeah, and I, um, being a humble businessman, I don't know the, the law on this very well. Oh dear. <laughs> Don, Don, Don froze. So, um, but, but I think, yeah, that's, that's our hope. That is our hope to try to make it as, as comprehensive as we can. Yeah, and I will say that one thing that I was impressed by um, in the text of the bill is it includes not only um, police brutality, um, excessive force and wrongful death cases, but also other forms of misconduct as well. Right. As the questioner, you know, kind of recognizes and asks the question, most most of these cases are brought under 42 U.S.C. 1983, so deprivation of civil rights by a state official, so deprivation of individual civil rights. But there are other causes of action uh, that that lie as well. Then there's often state immunity doctrine. So there's a lot of different laws that can either allow or then block a claim. Regardless, if the claim is serious enough where there's a settlement paid and taxpayers are footing the bill, the taxpayers should know about it. Yeah. Um, okay, um, unfortunately we seem to have lost a uh, representative buyer for the time being, um, but did you wanna close with um, more general observations about um, the anniversary of George Floyd's death and police reform generally? Yeah, I mean, I, I I have a child that lives in Minneapolis, just a couple of blocks from where George Floyd was murdered. And I've kind of watched this not only on the screen um, in the way, you know, everybody was, and it was traumatizing to me and I'm not an African-American and I'm not a person who's ever had a a, a frightening interaction with police, and yet it was traumatizing. So what about African-Americans? What about people who, you know, have had frightening interactions with police, but also I've kind of watched it through the eyes of one of my kids and the way my middle child looks at police and policing in the era of this. And it's just, it's just, traumatic. And, and the sad thing is, is we hardly get over the trauma of one and there's another one, even, even just in Minneapolis. I mean, the, there have been recent ones in the Twin Cities area since the, the death of George Floyd. The, the jury verdict in the George Floyd case was not accountability, but it was a step toward accountability. It was a step toward recognizing that we can't tolerate the intolerable and that there has to be justice in these instances. And yet still, you turn on the TV and you see the latest, you know, the latest body cam footage that's released that shows brutal treatment or in some instances, brutal treatment about which there were lies. People were told that their loved one died in one way and then the body cam footage gets released and we find that it was something else. Use of body cams is a little bit like this bill. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's let's put the, let's put the facts down on the table. And if we do, the facts as brutal as they can be, can nevertheless be a spur to doing something. And, and look, we've, we've said we would do something, but words are cheap. I think the, the burden is now on the Senate shoulders to produce. And, you know, my, my hope is we'll get the best version of a bill we can that can pass. I'm very committed to assisting all who are working on this. And um, we need to, to start earning trust back because again, the last thing I'll say is I worked in a city that had a, unacceptably high homicide rate and aggravated assault rate. And, and most of the people who were the victims of those crimes were African-Americans. And th this was a community that felt over-policed, hassled in minor ways, but, but also dramatically under-policed, unprotected against the most vicious crimes. And we worked very hard over a number of years to make our city safer through building a community policing model that didn't set police against the community, that didn't militarize the police, but made the police and the community feel more and more comfortable interacting. And then that led to safer communities. So I'm hoping that the police reform bill will be in the larger context of trying to get rid of some of the practices that have been perpetuated, some intentionally and some accidentally in the last 15 or 20 years that have militarized police or, or like use of tear gas, for example, or,
transfer of surplus military equipment to police in the aftermath of 9-11. That wasn't done to militarize the police. It was done, we were worried about terrorism. And so we have some extra military equipment, so why not? But then you end up in a situation where instead of the police department really being integrated within a community and protecting and serving that community, you have police in the community viewing each other as adversaries. So if we do this police reform bill right, um, what we will do is we will, you know, put our feet firmly in the community policing camp and start to embrace strategies that, that build bridges, and and that will make us safer, um, and that will restore trust, and that's what this bill is about. Okay, thank you so much, Senator Kane, and yeah, thank you so much to Representative Byer. I think um, we'll now just take a moment for our. Um, distinguished panelists to join us and then I will be introducing them shortly. Great, thank you a lot. So next we have with us a really exciting panel of experts on um, both data about police misconduct but also about the subject more generally. Um, so I'm going to introduce them as they appear on my screen which I hope is also how they appear on the audience screen. Um, so Professor Joanna Schwartz is a professor of law at the UCLA School of Law and one of the country's leading experts on uh, police misconduct lawsuits. Um, professor Philip Atiba Goff is the co-founder and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity um, and a professor of psychology and African-American studies at Yale University. Hilary Shelton, is, has been the director of the NAACP's Washington Bureau and senior vice president for advocacy and policy for over two decades, um, has been involved in many of the recent um, civil rights laws that have passed Congress and won numerous awards for his dedication and commitment to civil rights. And uh, Julie Ciccolini is the D director of law enforcement accountability for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, she previously, working for the New York Legal Aid Society, um, designed a database to track police misconduct. Um, so I wanted to start um, with asking the panelists, um, I think starting with Professor Goff, um, why they support um, the Cost of Police Misconduct Act and how it relates to the work that they do. So, Professor Goff. Thank you. I'm, I'm hoping that everybody can hear me. I'll tap the mic and ask if this thing is working. <laughs> All righty. Um, uh, so thank, thank you for, for having me. Um, uh, I think that the, the act is incredibly important. I mean, just for the fundamental reason that in, in this society where we have the ability um, to regulate the ways in which we try and keep each other safe, the ways in which communities try and keep themselves safe, how on earth can we pretend that, that these things matter if we don't bother to measure them, right? There's all of this harm that we've been looking at and we've seen broadcast on our televisions and on our smaller screens, um, uh, and we don't even measure police use of force uh, across the country. Um, there are hundreds of millions of dollars at least paid out in some of our big cities every single year. And we have no way of aggregating the costs of policing. And when we study this stuff, we, we do measure the benefits in terms of crime. But we don't measure the costs. And in, in this context, we can no longer go about doing a cost-benefit analysis with only half of the equation. So uh, it's, it's absolutely a necessary step towards getting our, our hands around how are we really going to set things up to genuinely center public safety in our systems that are called public safety systems. Okay, we are getting, um, I see in the chat, some difficulties hearing. So if everyone could try to uh, adjust their mics and speak up as much as possible, and I will do the same. Um, so Professor Schwartz, you've done a great deal of academic research about police brutality lawsuits and settlements. I wondered if you could briefly describe um, some of your findings and how they relate to this bill. Absolutely, I hope you can hear me uh, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Are you shaking your heads no that you can't hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> okay, good. Well. As long as somebody can hear me, that's that's uh, that's good enough. All right. So uh, I've done a lot of research trying to understand civil rights litigation, uh, the way in which 
uh, lawsuits influence police departments and police department decision making. And I support this bill for all of the reasons uh, that Dr. Goff has just mentioned. In addition, I think that it's worth noting and emphasizing that police departments and cities don't even have this information. So it's not just a matter of um, getting this information available to researchers uh, and overseers. It's a, it's a matter of forcing police departments and local governments to take account of this information. I've done research uh, examining how often police officers pay settlements and judgments entered against them and how local governments budget for and pay settlements and judgments in police misconduct suits. And that research has required me to do a lot of public records requests asking how much is paid in these cases. And I've asked upwards of a hundred uh, jurisdictions for this kind of information. And what is shocking to me is that many cities do not know, excuse me, I should say many police departments do not know how often they uh, deny indemnification to officers, make officers personally pay. They don't know how much is paid in settlements and judgments for their departments. Um, 26 of the largest agencies across the country, including New York City and Chicago and Philadelphia and Houston reported to me, they didn't know whether officers had ever contributed to settlements or judgments in civil rights lawsuits. And 18 of the largest cities and counties, and that includes Harris County, where Houston is, San Diego, Baltimore County, New Orleans, they reported to me that they keep no records in any government agency or office reflecting how much they spend in lawsuits involving the police in any given year. Uh, and so if outsiders can't uh, manage, get this information, it's partially because police departments don't have it either. There's other evidence of uh, federal legislation involving environmental admission, emissions and securities disclosure requirement, requirements that have improved behavior in part because those uh, companies have been forced to collect and disclose that information. And I support this bill because it follows along that well-tread uh, path of information regulation um, in the policing context. Thank you so much. Um, so before going on, I, I did wanna acknowledge that we're talking a lot about data and numbers. Of course, that's not the only cost of police brutality. It's not the only information we have about police brutality. Um, and I wanted to invite um, any of the panelists, especially uh, Hillary Shelton, to talk about um, the social costs and the human costs of police brutality. Can you, oh, well, let's see. Is there something that you can hear me? Some can hear you. Okay, very good, very good. As you mentioned, I work for the NAACP, of course, the United States' oldest and largest grassroots-based civil rights organization. We actually have units in every state in the United States and still happen to be on military bases in places like Italy, Germany, Korea, and Japan, as we were actively involved in helping with the integration of those armed forces as well throughout the country and throughout the world, as a matter of fact. And so thinking about these issues, one of the things that comes close to us is we're looking at the issue of solving many of the problems of police misconduct. Let me just say, when you're spending the kind of hundreds of millions of dollars that we're able to calculate thus far, knowing it's an underestimation, then you know it's a serious problem that we're gonna to have to deal with in a very thorough way. We know every year as the Justice Department releases this data on how many crimes were committed throughout our United States, how many murders and how many arsons and car thefts and assaults and rapes and everything else. We get that information as a tool, again, to begin moving in the direction of solving that problem. The numbers are much too high. As we look at the issues of where the focus is, we know those are problems that human beings and US citizens are working on. When we look at the issue of how much we're paying out, the hundreds of millions of dollars as we've noticed. Again, I would argue that we could easily be into the billions of dollars we're paying out in, uh, in settlements along these lines. We need to know what's going on with that. As you could tell, and I was very grateful for sharing the information about how many people don't know 
That is people in official positions. Police departments argue they do not know. Those who are supposed to be making decisions about how we address these issues don't know. That is to say, whether we're thinking about city councils, whether they're thinking about police councils for that matter, the state legislatures, governors or mayors, not to be able to balance that kind of data out as well makes it for a very tough problem of being solved. That is, as we talk about all these issues and all this data, we would argue, and one of the mantras in my office is in order to manage these problems, you must first measure them. Knowing what the problems and the challenges are at that level means we want to have the measurement of how it's working and sadly, how it's not working. That means that's we're crafting solutions. We utilize that same data. That is, how, how well have we done? Have we seen improvement in these areas? Where's the focus and the problem that we're experiencing along these lines? But for us to see and find out that millions of dollars are not accounted for, I would say, in many of these communities because we don't know what's going on. So thinking about how we could spend that money, we could really uh, reorganize and engage that money in a way to be more helpful. Now, we're just talking about dollars and cents, and don't get me wrong. And so thinking about the issues and challenges in our communities, we know when police misconduct occurs, it affects an, at least one individual. It's going to have an effect beyond that on an entire family, a community, and quite frankly, for those of us that have said in many places, throughout the United States and other places as well. I just happened to be in um, at the United Nations meeting in Geneva, Switzerland. When we began to talk about what was happening in Ferguson, Missouri, they knew what was going on and that debate was going on at our United Nations as well. They needed the data too, to be able to talk about how we make these things better, not only for each of these local communities, not only for the states they happen to be in, but throughout the country as well, because we know again, those resources don't just come from and are impacted at that local level. In many cases, those resources, these resources come from our states as well as our federal government. I mean, there's a better way for us to do it than to see the kind of waste that comes along as a byproduct of the damage that was done to a point that our courts decided that indeed that person was wrong to a point, whether we're talking about what just happened with the $27 million in a case whether we're talking about what's happening with a couple million dollars, which of course is how these things usually end up. So I'll stop there and say thank you. And uh, we'll go on to the next one. Okay. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, Julie Ciccolini, how did you use information about police lawsuits while you were for um, legal aid in your city? Did someone unmute me? Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay, great, sorry, I didn't do it. So thanks for whoever helped me out there. Um, so in New York City, I tracked police misconduct or lawsuits filed against the NYPD uh, for over three years. I reviewed every federal lawsuit that was filed, the officers named the allegations and the outcomes. And it was extremely helpful in identifying abusive officers, commands, policing patterns and practices we identified various problematic patterns that kept repeating. Um, for example, officers were routinely arresting people for trespassing when they were visiting friends in public housing, or particular units were unlawfully entering homes without warrants, um, or we saw how patrol guide policies were or weren't being enforced. Uh, for example, a new policy for that was supposed to prevent officers from retaliating against people for recording them with their cell phones um, went into effect, and yet we saw routine lawsuits being filed over and over again for that same behavior. We found single officers named in over 40 lawsuits, and we were able to do social network analysis to find groups of officers and commands who were frequently engaging in the same problematic behavior. Um, and we were able to look at this data as more than bad cops, but bad policies, bad incentives, and bad policing tactics. Um, and so you find that when you fail to track this information, these patterns aren't noticed, this misconduct goes unchecked. And I think uh, Professor Schwartz hit the nail on the head at the beginning that what we want to do here is make the departments actually have to look at this information. Because at the time, I knew way more about what was happening in these lawsuits than the police department did. Um, and so I think that's one of the most important aspects about this is making them track this themselves. And um question for you, but also to any of the panelists who happen to know. 
were you finding that police officers who were involved in either really egregious cases or involved repeatedly in cases, would they get face any discipline? Would they be fired uh, for wrongdoing that resulted in these settlements? There's an epic failure of any sort of feedback loop between the Department uh, for Civil Litigation. Um, it does not automatically result in any type of review. Uh, in New York, for example, they recently released a database of all the discipline brought against officers um, in the past five years. And of the top 10 most sued officers that I had tracked, most of which had been involved in settlements totaling over a million dollars, only one had ever faced any discipline. Um, we even checked of 97 cops who had been named in excessive force lawsuits that settled for 100,000 or more in those three years, only three had ever been disciplined by the department. And so it's pretty evident when you look at the numbers and do those comparisons, the officers aren't being held accountable for civil litigation. Um, and it, it's very apparent that there isn't that feedback loop that's automatically triggering any sort of investigation into the misconduct that's being alleged. I would just add that this is research that that I've also done in this in this area that it is an oversight failure and it is also an information failure uh, because um, the information is absolutely not being used by police departments in the in the research that I've done I found that when an officer is sued the city attorney will defend the case the money to pay settlement or judgment is going to be paid from central funds. And there really is no effort for the police department to gather and analyze information from lawsuits uh, that are brought against their officers to identify problem officers or to identify problem practices. And in fact, when lawsuits are filed uh, in some places, uh, police departments stop any internal affairs investigation that they're doing because they don't want to produce information internally that could be used against them in the civil lawsuit. Um, so th there is uh, there are huge information problems, not just regarding the ultimate disposition of the case and the amount paid, but regarding the information that is unearthed during litigation. Uh, it does not does not it is not used by police departments um, as a rule to try to better understand what's going on with their officers and their policies. Just if I can, just to add on. Um, <clears throat> uh, in, in many of these contexts, when uh, you start hearing, especially the, the work of Professor Schwartz has been doing this since anybody has been doing this, um, you hear people say, oh, well, we need to, we need to innovate. This seems just like a, a thing we need to go ahead and, and, and square the circle on. Because obviously you'd want to manage the performance on this. It's a performance management issue. I think it's really important in this context to get every other successful organization in the history of humanity has measured things and held themselves accountable to it to optimize the, the positive outcomes, including policing. When we look at the huge crime decline that law enforcement likes to, and I think in some places can take some credit for, it's in part because of a performance management system known as CompStat, where law enforcement started tracking patterns in crime and holding themselves accountable to bringing it down. So it's not like the idea of a feedback loop for bad outcomes is foreign to law enforcement. It's part of over 80% of law enforcement across the United States. It's just in the areas of actual justice we haven't been measuring, there hasn't been that feedback loop, and it communicates really clearly to communities that law enforcement isn't set up to care about those sets of things. And um, a general question for anyone on the panel, it's, it's one thing to say that, uh, to, to, re to tell law enforcement to collect data, even to require it, but actually getting it reported can be more problematic. Um, Earlier when he was speaking, Senator Kane mentioned um, a requirement to report deaths in custody, which um, there was a version of it in 2000. It was reenacted in 2014. And, um, you know, six years later, a pandemic, uh, thousands and thousands of, of deaths later, the, the law hasn't even really begun to be enforced. Um, why is that and what can the Justice Department do um, to get states and local governments to really report what they should be reporting? So 
since we're talking about broader data collection, I'll go ahead and volunteer. It's kind of my jam. Um, <laughs> I want to also uh, 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 just sort of note that the death and custody um, bill, it, it was first authorized before 2000. It was reauthorized in 2000. Then it lapsed. Then it was re reauthorized in 2014. And one day soon, maybe we'll get, collect the first data. Part of the reason is because you can't just mandate data collection with a magic wand and then expect it to appear. You have to actually create the infrastructure and you have to create penalties for non-compliance. Otherwise, it's a suggestion to please tell us some things in a format that we can't count or compare anything with. So there's 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the United States. About 75% of them are 25 officers or fewer. And there's a thousand that are just one dude. That's sometimes <laughs> always dude, right? So Officer Ricky, who is a, a police force of one, doesn't have a data information system that can reasonably be uh, thought to be interoperable with the NYPD. That's the reality of this. So the laws as they're crafted are untethered to the realities of data collection, aggregation, auditing, cleaning, standardization, all of which is necessary if you want to know anything about it. So the ways we got to move forward on any of these bills to, to collect data is work backwards from the questions you want answers to. Because once you've got the idea of this is the question, here's how we would go about answering it, that's gonna tell you the way you've gotta collect the data. And then once you've done all that, you have to build in some me mechanism for saying, and if you don't, here's what's going to happen. Because otherwise, again, it's just a suggestion. And I can tell you in the midst of dealing with things where you are feeling massively understaffed and there's all these other things you get asked to do, making sure that there's somebody in some distant tower counting something, which seems untethered to your own job, it's gonna be last on the priority list a hundred times out of a hundred. Professor Schwartz, do you have something to add? You seem to be muted. I do have something to add, and I hope you can hear me now. Um, I once again, you can just for for everything that uh, Phil Goff says, you can just for, I just say ditto to to anything that he that he says. Um, but uh, you know, I, I one thing that I, I think that absolutely that implementation of of data collection is really challenging, and. Uh, if you actually look at New York, New York City, the New York City Comptroller's Office has been trying to cajole, force, request the city to the police department to better collect information about its its settlements and judgments for decades, uh, and is slowly moving forward in that um, in that journey. But it it is very difficult to get information, even if you have the authority to uh, to demand it. I do think that. Um, settlements and judgments in police misconduct cases may be one step easier simply because there is a paper record through the court system. Um, and there are, it's not just in the hands of officers submitting reports, but this is, you know, these are settlements that usually go through city council approval. Um, there are paper trails for this, which I think it makes them one step easier. And then this is a this is a process um, in terms of, of sort of the ultimate outcome of reducing police violence and misconduct. Getting this settlement and judgment data is the first step to begin investigating what's going on in troubling departments. So you can see this in the amazing work that The Guardian and The Washington Post have done crowdsourcing data about police killings. Uh, they have collected all of this information and then identified different places that are hotspots. What's going on in Kern County, California, where so many people are being killed by police? That is a, 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 a beacon, an indication there's something going wrong in this, in this county that can then be investigated in more depth. So this is just a first step, a first layer of information gathering that I think can prompt deeper investigation into the places that cause concern. Um, can, can you hear me up? Yeah. Okay, you can hear me now, very good, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and I agree with all that one of the issues that was raised a little bit earlier uh, on this call was that the president of the United States has just signed the No Hate Law, uh, in, or No Hate Act into law. This is a provision in hate crimes in which we were recognizing that we weren't getting all the data. That is, in some cases, the crimes were being collected, but we did not recognize that it was indeed a hate crime. And as such, we were not processing it in a way that we can try to prevent these things from happening again or expedite. 
cases along those lines as they happen. So thinking about issues along these lines, the same thing applies. We want to make sure the best tools are in place to provide first the assistance to the local communities that are willing to collect the data around those lines. And then secondly, we want to make sure that we're also having we have tools in which we can collect it in an accurate manner that, again, would allow us to take that next step. And that next step is we go from recognizing just how expansive the problem is to crafting solutions that are working in all the communities that are affected. It makes a big difference in both cases, and we're going to have to move along those lines as well, we believe. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to add, like the other panelists up here, I've read thousands of civil litigation, and, and the data I would say was the most helpful was never the settlement number, actually. It was what was written within that document. Um, and so I think we do have to be cautious about making it seem that this is a problem because the cost is so high. The problem is that the brutality is so high. And the way we figure that out is by tracking the allegations that are being made. So no number that we know about the department spending is going to be able to illuminate what that cost actually means, what that erosion of trust does. Um, you know, the families who've lost loved ones, who've wrongfully spent years in prison. Um, we need to focus on reducing the brutality, not the cost. And so I think the heart of the bill is in the right place, but we need to be careful about the language. And I think the, the parts where we're focused on the allegations are actually the most important. If we care about accountability and accountability to who, um, it's knowing what's actually going wrong and not just how much we're spending for it, uh, because that's all court stuff who determines the damages. It's not telling us exactly, um, you know, what's going wrong. And I, and I think everyone's right here. This is a start. It's a start to get there. Um, but when real, we'll see real change is once we actually know those allegations and we have departments actually tracking them and paying attention to it. Um, yeah, I think that's a question. I believe I've read an article by Professor Schwartz saying that the cities and jurisdictions with the biggest settlements you know, there are obviously notorious cases like George Floyd, like Breonna Taylor, where there's, there's a murder or a, an egregious act in a large settlement. But in general, you can't necessarily conclude that the departments are paying the most to have the worst brutality problems, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's important to to keep in mind that that these settlements and judgments are the products of what I called in this in this article the civil rights ecosystems in which they arise. And when you look at, I mean, in some parts of the country, um, I applaud uh, you know the work of of, of civil rights lawyers uh, who who are um, in in. Uh, in, in across the country, but in some parts of the country, there are very few lawyers who are willing to bring these cases. When I looked at research, uh, looking at the Houston Police Department and the Philadelphia Police Department, their departments are about the same size. 10 times more cases were filed against the Philadelphia Police Department than against the Houston Police Department. And plaintiffs in cases in the Philadelphia Department against the Philadelphia Police Department and its officers recovered more than a hundred times what the plaintiffs did in Houston. That is not because uh, that police officers in Philadelphia are a hundred times worse than police officers in Houston. It's because of a lot of things that judges are less sympathetic to these cases in uh, Houston. Juries are less sympathetic to these cases in Houston. The law is much harder for the plaintiffs to get around in Houston. And because of all of those things, there are very few lawyers who are experienced civil rights lawyers willing to bring lawsuits in Houston. There's, I found two or three who had brought more than more than one or two of these cases. Um, whereas there's more of a robust uh, plaintiff's bar in Philadelphia willing to bring these cases. It's still hard to bring these cases and win in Philadelphia. But I, I offer that example just to, um, to illustrate that you could look at payments in Houston and Philadelphia and conclude that Philadelphia is doing terribly and Houston's doing great when it comes to police misconduct. And that would be a mistake. Uh, so you have to consider these numbers as one indication and then do the digger, the, the deeper digging to figure out what's going on in these places. So it's the idea would be less to make a chart and say, okay, let's rank all the cities as far as how brutal their police are by the settlements and more to 
encourage the community to look at what's going on in, in that city and that city. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And you can also cross compare, you know, if you look at Houston's data and 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 Philadelphia's data regarding settlements and judgment, and you also look at Houston's and Philadelphia's data regarding police killings, regarding police uh, terminations, regarding criminal investigations. When you see a disconnect between the amount that's being paid and other indications that there are things going on that are problems in those jurisdictions, that in and of itself is worth investigating. Um. I wanted to ask uh, Hillary Felton, who has probably uh, spent the most time around Capitol Hill and anyone on this panel, I would guess, except, you know, possibly accepting the senators and congressmen. <laughs> um, how has the debate over policing changed that you've seen? And why do you think data about, um, about dollars and cents can make a difference in that debate? <laughs> See, I, I believe that uh, the big issue is, as we're talking about spending for policing, I think many of us have an idea of just what policing is, that it's not just a, an armed person in our neighborhood telling us if we're breaking the law or not, but as we put on the side of some cars is service and protection and providing other issues and other kinds of uh, services as well. Uh, that being said, the importance of making sure that we're seeing that if we're not looking at the damages that are done as we're carrying out things as they are now. If we're not looking at the cases and why it was that the judge in many of those cases found that indeed the person that uh, that was wrong, the, the citizen, the, the resident of the United States that was harmed by a police officer was done for all the wrong reasons and as such, uh, compensation needs to be brought to that person and or their family. And in some cases, the changes we need in local communities. All that's to say is that if we don't have this data, we can't see exactly where those problems are. Let me put this in, in this context for just a minute as well. As we're looking at these cases, as we're looking at what's going on in these communities, we know that for law enforcement to be effective, uh, they indeed must have the perception of trust and integrity by the communities they're serving. And that's not something I made up, but kind of going back to my hair was a little darker when Janet Reno was in the Justice Department. Uh, Kwesi Nfumi, the president of the NAACP and myself, sat down with her to talk about policing issues. And one of the issues we talked about of a provision that's actually in the George Floyd bill was the issue of racial profiling. The second issue was the misuse of force. And in talking to her about, so we need some, a better way to control for these issues. And she turned to me and said, Hillary, look, I totally agree with you. Being in law enforcement means that we want to prevent crimes from happening in the first place. And when they do, we want to be able to solve them. If indeed the communities don't trust us, they're not going to give us information that may prevent a crime from happening in the first place. If they don't trust us, they won't call us in to tell us indeed the information they have because they are fearful that an information will be misused that indeed more harm will come in some communities. And we see that all too often. We can talk about a case in which the police were sent out to a man that was mentally disabled. As he was at, at a sixth grade level in his development, though he was 40 years of age, but still living with his mother. When the police arrived, someone that had never been to his house in that part of the community before, they saw him twiddling a screwdriver and immediately told everyone to stand back because he's armed and shot him to death. Now doesn't make any sense in many ways for it to play out that way, but that's exactly how it played in the police officer. They shot him to death, was not punished in any way. It was assumed just that collateral damage that too often goes along providing great safety in our neighborhoods and in our communities. So the kind of data and the kind of approach that we really need is one that will provide that information at the front end. The people living in the communities will feel secure calling police officers under those circumstances, but will also understand, as we did with somebody who was mentally disabled, I can talk about another case, which a man was mentally disabled pretty much at the same level. The police officers decided to surround him. And if you watch the video, and I have to honestly say the reason we're able to solve more of these problems now is because of the video that comes to us through social media. What you'll see is those police officers then began fanning out 
as, as if they were planning on performing a firing squad. And they didn't want to hit each other, but they all wanted to make sure they were able to hit the disabled man. And indeed, he had a, a little pocket knife, you know, kind of a Swiss Army type pocket knife. And they shot him to death while we watched it on video as well. Let me just say, that's just a couple of examples of how bad it gets. And we've got to make sure that we're, number one, collecting the data. Number two, have very clear policies on what police officers are to do and not to do under those circumstances. And number three, recognize that we are not playing those first two parts through. We're going to end up with more people being killed as we've seen too much of in this last year, even as we've been locked in the house during the pandemic. And we'll also find ourselves not able to actually make the changes and provide the performance and protections that we really count on our law enforcement to provide for our communities and our families. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Julie, Julie um, how important do you think it is that information about police misconduct is not just collected by departments and even by the Justice Department, but also um, made available to the public? First we'll ask, oh, Megan now? Okay, I think we're both playing with it. Um, I think that's the most crucial aspect of this bill um, because I respect what everyone has been saying and the optimism that making this transparent will inspire introspection in departments and behavior change. I'm not as optimistic. Um, some departments are already required to do this. The NYPD has been reporting um, on this since 2017. This has spent $1 billion in the past five years settling police misconduct. Um, I would argue when comparing those lawsuits, there hasn't been significant behavior change. But what I will say is I think this is, bill is important for other reasons, which is making this data publicly available and allowing the public to hold those officers accountable. That's really important. As a member of the public, I can investigate what officers are doing wrong, their patterns and practices, and make sure those are known in court during litigation. Those are known to the defense of those who've been accused. Um, those are known to families who have just suffered from misconduct. And it's known when speaking to public officials. And so I think that's a, a huge key to this is allowing the public to actually hold uh, law enforcement accountable when the government and law enforcement themselves fail. Thanks. Um, so one question I wanted to direct, especially to Professor Schwartz, but um, to the panel more generally is that as, um, as you know, one of the most controversial provisions of the Justice and Policing Act is about ending qualified immunity, which would make it easier to bring civil lawsuits against police officers. Um, and one of the main arguments against that is that if police officers are at risk of, you know, losing their house and losing all their savings because they made one split second mistake, um, no one's going to be willing to be a police officer but um, it's not usually the officer who pays, right? It is virtually never the officer who pays. Uh, and that has nothing to do with qualified immunity. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the arguments that are made against reform of qualified immunity, and they're arguments that have been made for decades in support of qualified immunity and in support of making the defense even stronger is this idea that police officers will be bankrupted for making split second uh, mistakes in, in the split second high pressure stakes circumstances of their, of their job. And it's simply untrue. Uh, I researched the frequency with which police officers contribute to settlements and judgments entered against them. I looked at 81 jurisdictions, small, medium, and large. Uh, over a six year period uh, in those jurisdictions, more than $735 million was paid in, in settlements and judgments. And officers contributed 0.02% of those dollars. So 99.98% of the dollars were paid by uh, the cities or their insurers or through a bond or some other mechanism, not the officer. Just two of the jurisdictions, Cleveland and New York City, confirmed that they had ever required officers to contribute. Uh, 
in that those two cities, the most any officer had to contribute was $25,000. The next highest was 16. The average that officers contributed to these settlements and judgments was $2,000, uh, not the kind of amount that uh, that bank that's going to bankrupt uh, any officers. And the reason for this uh, widespread payment by cities instead of officers um, are because of state uh, statutes and local policies that provide for what's called the indemnification of officers. These are agreements that provide that when officers have acted in the course and scope of their employment or haven't acted maliciously, there's usually some sort of uh, boundary for this, but that if officers were, were essentially doing their job, um, that the officer's uh, lawyer would be paid for and that any settlement and judgment would be paid uh, would be paid um, by the city. I also found that even when local governments could, looking at the language of the statutes or the policies, deny indemnification to their officers, they very rarely do. I found many circumstances where officers were indemnified even though they had been disciplined, terminated, criminally convicted, situations where punitive damages had been awarded by juries specifically to punish the individual officer, local government steps in and takes care of the bill. And I found even in the very, very rare circumstances when officers are denied indemnification, they still don't pay. That's for a different reason, which is that lawyers and, and their clients don't tend to want to go after an officer who doesn't have the resources to pay anything in a settlement or judgment. So they will try to pursue a claim against the city or against another officer who has been indemnified. All of those dynamics and policies and laws combined together lead to the result that officers virtually never pay. And I will just want to say one other thing about the, about the other side of the, or the other component of the argument against qualified immunity, which is that officers are being held liable for split second uh, mistakes. The fact of the matter is, that the United States Supreme Court has interpreted the Constitution so that officers do not violate the Constitution when they make reasonable mistakes. And when the Supreme Court has defined what a reasonable mistake is, they focus entirely on the perspective of the officer. It's what the officer perceived, the totality of the circumstances facing the officer. The Supreme Court has said, you can't use 2020 hindsight. You have to think about what the officer experienced at the time. And that is a standard that has meant that officers can arrest the wrong person, can search someone who has nothing on them, can uh, shoot someone who is unarmed if they reasonably thought that they were holding a gun instead of a cell phone. And, uh, and so the idea that officers are going to be held liable for reasonable mistakes if qualified immunity is done away with completely ignores the way in which the Constitution, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, already protects reasonable mistakes. And the idea that officers would be bankrupted ignores an entirely different um, web of protections for officers' bank accounts, these indemnification agreements that also have nothing to do with qualified immunity. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask uh, a few more general questions for the panel, and then I'm going to try to take uh, some of the questions we've gotten from the audience. Um, one question I have for all of you is, what provisions of the Justice and Policing Act do you think are most important for Congress to pass and will have the most effect? And um, what, if you were writing the bill, uh, what provision would you add to it that's not in it now? And, you know, I, the senator and congressman are gone. You don't have to say the cost of adding the cost of police misconduct act. Well, maybe I, I can start a bit, um, and because I think my answer is going to be probably not all that direct. There's so many provisions in the Justice and Policing Act that we've worked on individually and collectively in different slices. Mm -hmm. And in essence, as many of us sat down to talk with members of Congress, both the House and the Senate, about what was really needed to address the problem, it became clear that whether we're talking about qualified immunity, racial profiling, use of force policies, or other issues that are very much a part 
of the legislation, there's an important role for each and every one of them. And certainly we would even expand it a bit wider to add this wonderful piece of legislation that our friend Senator Kane and Congressman Beyer have moved to put in place as well. These are crucial components to a problem that's huge. Listen, there were some and that came out and said that the reason that uh, we've had we have this problem uh, is because we have not comprehensively addressed what we want a police officer to be. We hadn't talked about wraparound services and the mistakes that are made. We didn't talk about, you know, the the uh, the caretaker that took the uh, the young disabled man to a, a grassy area to let him relax and everything, and the police came out blasting. We weren't talking about those issues, but if we're going to really fix this problem, it's not surprising in many ways that there's some that wanted to eliminate, uh, quite frankly, the uh, police departments altogether. Now, that's not where the NAACP is, but I understand their feelings. Their feelings are that we have a comprehensive problem. It really is going to require, require a comprehensive response if we're going to solve this and add, again, safety and security back to our communities. So I guess if we're talking about our, our favorite parts of the Justice and Policing Act, I'll, I'll um, uh, echo my, my good friend Hillary um, and saying there's a lot in there to like. Um, I'll also call attention to the National Registry for Officer Misconduct. Speaking of measuring things that it's absurd we haven't been measuring before and keeping that in a central location. Um, I'll raise up the lowering of the 242 standard um, that allows uh, uh, federal civil rights uh, infrastructure to be involved um, when someone is reckless with someone's life, especially if the local and the state level is unwilling to be. Uh, but there's a lot to like in there because there's so much, there's an absurd amount that we still should be doing. I, I, gotta, I gotta sort of do a level set here. There is none of this that's gonna solve the problem. This puts in all of the, the Justice and, and Policing Act, um, if we're gonna measure and, and requ require the re reporting of settlements, any piece of it, uh, uh, Representative Porter has just come out um, with uh, legislation uh, uh, to fund mental health response instead of law enforcement. All of that is great as a step zero not even a first step because we've not even begun to seriously think about if we're going to try and deliver public safety to communities how would we do it from the beginning not from the beginning where slavery was cool not from the beginning where jim and jane crow were the official law of the land right not from the beginning where it was okay to firebomb either in tulsa or in philadelphia but now where at least we out loud pretend that everybody here gets to be a full human being, how would we begin to set that up? And so the things that we're doing at federal legislation, all of them are necessary and we should start with the assumption that they're all insufficient. But the next thing I wanna see after this next wave is support for the local communities that are the ones who are gonna end up becoming the models. Places like Ithaca and Tompkins County, New York that said, hey, if we're gonna start from scratch, Let's have a department of community solutions and public safety where it's led by someone who's civilian, it's majority unarmed, and we never send an armed response to a nonviolent crisis. How about we give folks the resources they need to do the transition so they have an infrastructure to decide, I want to solve this problem before guns and badges ever get involved, and I want to scale down. I want to do exactly, by the way, what law enforcement has been asking for for the last quarter century. Take us out of mental health, substance abuse, child welfare, homelessness, right? Put us into the places where we can go where violence is threatened. But to affect that transition, it's going to take money. And so one of the best things the federal government can do is fund places like Ithaca, like Berkeley, like Denver, like Baltimore, like Newark, that are trying to do this already, that are figuring it out, that are failing and succeeding so that they can measure it and that we can document these are the things that are working. Here's how we scale it to the other places. Because otherwise, we're going to be here five years, 10 years, 20 years. We do this usually on a 30-year cycle, right? We'll be here 30 years from now and we'll be like, great, it's time for the first step after step zero. And I got to say, I got 10 God kids. I'm not interested in them reaching my age, feeling as frustrated as I feel right now. Go ahead, Julie. 
Can someone unmute me? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. There's when I go to click the button, something pops up over it. I promise I'm I I do tech. I'm usually not this challenged. Um <laughs> but I, I wanted to just highlight one um key point, which is that we actually do not know which officers work in which department across the country, even that one little dude. Um, and what that means is that those officers can transfer departments relatively easily, especially after being fired for misconduct. Um, most people are familiar with the Tamir Rice case, um, but many don't know that that officer was actually resigned before termination at a department um, a few counties away before he joined the force. Um, that problem could be solved with a licensing structure for police officers and uh, actually tracking where they are within the department and then decertifying them uh, when they do get fired or engage in misconduct severe enough for decertification. And so just a, a simple licensing and identifying number for officers the same way we do for attorneys um, would allow us to track officers and prevent them from switching departments to, to hide misconduct. Christ. <laughs> Am I in here now? All right. <laughs> um, so I will um, say, I think that, you know, th there is, um, I think about these things at, at, at two, at both levels, um, or at, at least two levels. One is, one is sort of what I imagine that Congress can get accomplished, both in the political climate and also because um, of where they sit at the federal, you know, at the federal level, um, legislating, you know, generally across the the country. And when it, so when I think about what they're best situated to do, um, I do think that things like the decertification um, pr provisions and the the requirement that data is collected. Um, as well as changing legal standards like ending qualified immunity is where they are best suited. Um, if we're uh, in the you know in the the world of of magic wands and wishes um, and thinking about what Congress might do, I also am in favor of um, having uh, in addition to ending qualified immunity, ending the standards for holding cities uh, liable because there are. The, these problems are not just individual officer problems, they're systemic problems. Um, and for all that we've, the time we have spent, and I've spent talking about the problems with qualified immunity, actually holding a city liable for systemic problems is almost as difficult legally as getting past the qualified immunity barrier. Um, so I think that, you know, in my ideal world, we would reconsider those standards as well. But I also think that the challenges that we are facing um, with policing, how we understand policing, what we what we what we authorize um, law enforcement to do, um, and really rethinking what those requirements are, is critically important. And my best guess is that those things happen instead of from the top down, from the ground up, with um, with uh, local governments. Um, reconsidering those really important questions. And so, um, you know, I think that that may be some of the most critical and long lasting work that gets done. It just, I don't, I don't see it getting done as, as easily from the, from the congressional level, but, but I, I am encouraged to see it happening in, in, in beginning stages um, around the country. And I think supporting those efforts is, you know, among the most, very most important things we can do. Okay, I'm going to um, turn now to some questions from the audience. Um, so here's the first question is, how do you overcome the paternal order of police that opposes civilian oversight? And this question um, is specifically about Chicago, but I think these are issues that come up nationwide. Um, and just today I voted no confidence in the police chief or the mayor, even though she supports the police chief every chance she gets. So um, good question. Uh, if anybody else here has an answer, um, please go to the front of the line, collect a million dollars um, and fix all kinds of things. Um, it's a good question because it's, uh, it's, it's not one that I've ever seen anybody fully successfully answer. 
Um, the way that we have done labor in this country is incredibly complex. Um, uh, the way that it works in policing is different than it works in every other sector. Um, and it's gotten us in uh, just a, a load of trouble. Uh, a couple of things that I think it's useful to note. Um, one is that when dealing with police unions, I have never met a police executive that has fond, fond feelings for its for the union that oversees um, uh, sort of uh, entry level officers and sergeants. And the reason is because when they want to make change, the union often is very much in the way. That's in part because of this perverse incentive structure that we see in unions that I don't think we talk nearly enough about, which is many folks in a union will say that union leadership doesn't really feel like it represents me. Right. Because I don't want the bad officers here. You've heard pro probably the, the saying um, nobody hates a bad officer better than, a, than a, more than a good officer. Like, I don't want that 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 bad officer here either. And yet no one has ever won a union election by saying I'm going to support some of you. That doesn't happen. What happens is they say I'm going to support the worst officer no matter what. Everybody gets my support and that person gets all of the votes. So we can we can mess with that structure. We can encourage folks to say, hey, you don't have to have that incentive structure. Um, and I'm seeing people start to move that that way. I'm seeing black and, and women officers band together and say they've never represented us and we need to do something different. The other piece is unions do have a limit on their power, especially in mid-size and small cities, which I think are going to become the models. So I go back to Ithaca. I go back there because I think it's such an inspiring example. And also because we spent at the Center of Policing for Policing Equity, we spent the last nine months trying to help them. But <laughs> as they were going forward to put together their proposal for the New York State, because everybody in New York State had to have a, a proposal for reimagining public safety, um, we were told very explicitly the union was going to sue because that's what unions do. They sue to stop the dissolving of a police department. And then the Monday before the vote in Ithaca, which was unanimous, the Police Benevolent Association did something I never imagined I would see. They came publicly and said, here are the parts of the plan that we can support. And they said nothing else. Now, I don't think I'm ever in, in my lifetime going to see a police union endorse the dissolution of a police department. I don't think that's the thing that's replicable. But the reason it happened was because communities got together and they said, if you ever want anything like legitimacy here, you want to work here again, you can lead or get dragged. I think we forget that this is a public service. And in, in cities where we think this is the biggest deal, cities like Chicago in New York and L.A., where we've seen just historic generational um, sort of ruptures and holes punched through communities, it's hard to imagine how you get your arms around it. Chief uh, Commissioner Ramsey in Philadelphia fired six officers. They were back by the end of the week because of the union contract. But most of the country isn't those cities. And most of the country can do different. And if you apply the pressure in the smaller places first, it makes it a lot harder for Philadelphia to, to figure out why it can't be like Muncie, Indiana. And I think that's part of the, the path forward is to really support the places where communities got enough of an, of an arm width hold around itself that it can do the change that, that activists and organizers are calling for and then hold that up as an example and dare the bigger cities not to follow behind. That's as good as I can get for a non-answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, it, one of the things that's been very striking to me over the last year is just realizing that the, the level of civilian control over the police in a lot of places seems to be not great. And um, it's hard to know where to go from that. But um, I thank the questioner for raising it. Let me um, go to the next. I mean, I mean, can I transfer to, to, to Hillary by saying, and even in the places where you have what seems like strong civilian control, the selection criteria over who gets to be on the civilian control ends up um, sort of shifting towards people who are current or former law enforcement, so it doesn't represent the most vulnerable communities. Like, if, if we're going to really do this, we have to talk about the reality of it. We got to be in the weeds in order to, to, to rip out the weeds. Hillary, I know you were trying to get in here. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I hope you can hear me now. Um, but it, it is a challenge. Let me begin by saying I'm a huge supporter of unions and been a member of unions in the past and whatnot, working for Greater Boston Legal Services years and years ago and otherwise. They, they play a very, very healthy role most of the time. And you say, what are the challenges that we're having in, in this particular case as well as at what point a police officer, an individual can be held accountable for wrongdoings? And what we've seen too often in these cases is the things like the police officers of Bill of Rights gets utilized not only as a tool that ends up being something passed in, in state legislatures, 
but it's also provisions in union contracts. As a matter of fact, most of it started in union contracts. Now, again, I'm a strong believer in people being paid a fair day's wage for a hard day's work. And unions work to do that, and we're grateful that that is the case. Whether you're a member of a union or not, that work being done for those who are has a positive impact on for those who are not as well. And, and so I also agree, we're going to have to have a, a serious look at what kind of policies cannot and should not be part of a union contract or uh, sh can or should not be part of whatever the state law is around how law enforcement officials can act and react in so many of these cases. So one of the reasons I believe that we, many of these provisions were put in the George Floyd bill was to recognize from a federal level kind of up on high that we shouldn't be able to continue to do that. The, uh, that, that, thin veil, that thin blue veil is something that we're going to have to get around and can't do anymore. Again, for our law enforcement officials to be effective and we want them to all be effective at protecting our communities and providing services uh, that are much needed. We also wanna make sure that allowing them to literally in some cases get away with murder I know this is going to come back to haunt me, but I'll just say it. A getaway of murder means that the entire system cannot work effectively to provide the protection we all so often and so dearly need. Yeah, could one of you um, explain a little more about what a police officer's bill of rights is? Sure, I, I can begin by saying it, it, it's something that's done to give a, additional protections for police officers to carry out certain services, including the use of deadly force if necessary. Um, it provides additional protection for them in some areas as well, including uh, police officers not having to say anything about the outcome or what happened uh, in a questionable situation uh, for, I've seen 72 hours, and I've seen longer periods of time than that. Of course, one of the fears along those lines that it further works to undercut the trust necessary for officers to be effective in their communities is if they can wait three or days or longer before even providing information on what happened. Uh, we've seen cases that just looks like it provides an opportunity for a coordination that is not even legal under most other circumstances and being able to question the witnesses, receive the uh, the reports done by other police officers and others before they even say anything that speaks specifically uh, to the issues involved in the um, in the, the problematic incident. Thanks. Um, I also wanted to ask um, Julie Ciccolini, who's I think um, been litigating in the trenches, what, um, what do you think our courts and prosecutors can do better in response to police misconduct? I should clarify, I'm not a litigator, oh. um, but I do think <laughs> I, I do think prosecutors play a huge role in holding police accountable. Um, they are kind of the first check on any um, any case that's brought to them and the conduct of the officers there. And if they recognize violations, should be tracking those and properly disclosing them to the defense. Um, I, I think prosecutors do also need to be tracking police misconduct the same way we're asking departments to. Um, and there needs to be a, fed, a, federal, a better feedback loop between the, the courts and departments, because we we see a lot of times in cases that officers' conduct does get questioned. Um, a judge will find that they violated a, a Fourth Amendment right, did an unlawful search, um, and, and there's nothing that that reports that back to a department. And so, how are you supposed to learn anything about officers' conduct or how to better improve your cases um, when that's not happening? You know, and it affects the whole part of the system, right? There, it may have been an arrest that um, it now has to be dismissed because of that officer's conduct and they need to be retrained on on what uh, probable cause is, you know? Uh, so I think that's a that's a huge role um, is just setting up these feedback loops between the courts and the departments. Um, so we're about out of time. I wanted to give each of our, first of all, I wanted to thank all of the panelists so much for this discussion and I wanted to give them um,
I'll take the moderator privilege and let them say just a few closing words they'd like to share. Um, and I guess I'll go with the order you are on my screen. So, um, Professor Schwartz. I really appreciate being part of this conversation. Uh, thank you uh, so much for being here, and uh, and and you know I appreciate the the conversation and my uh, co-panelists, and and I appreciate uh, what has brought us here, which is um, an attention to uh, to data and to the importance of data. And uh, you know, thank uh, Representative Byer and Senator Kane for introducing this bill and and bringing uh, such public attention to these important issues. Um, Mr. Shelton. No, th thank you. I, I, I too want to thank Congressman Byer and Senator Kane for their leadership on this. It's a tough issue, but it is important that we have the information to make the right decisions. We've got a, a fantastic comprehensive piece of legislation before us in the Floyd bill that has passed the House now twice and is pending in the U.S. Senate. Uh, we also know that some other pieces would be extremely helpful, and that being the tool that we need to make sure that our law enforcement and community protections add up to everything they need to be. So with that, I hope everyone, uh, this thing, this will reach out to their members of Congress on the House and Senate side and get them engaged in this as well. That as we move to pass the Floyd bill, that indeed we see what the, the cost is as we talk about the, the human damage that we see too often on our TV screens, but we also see the misuse of funds as we're paying for those so recklessly move to so-called carry out their responsibilities in a manner that has become dangerous and deadly to so many in our communities to the point that those in on, on our courts, those who serve on our bench, are finding it necessary to compensate the individuals and the families of those they find themselves in such an awful situation. Thanks. Um, very quick walk words from <laughs> um, from Ms. Ciccolini and uh, Professor Goff. Um, I, thank you, Congressman Byron, Senator Kane, for introducing this legislation and um, recognizing that this is worthy of tracking and, and important to those who have been victims of police brutality um, and all of those who are working to try and prevent that in the future. Um, and thanks to my fellow panelists for a really interesting discussion. I'll add my thanks to the panel, also to Representative Beyer and to Senator Kane. I also want to just add one note of, of context for all of us walking away. Um, uh, in the height of last summer, we're almost a year out from um, the, the one year anniversary. Uh, the, we're almost a year out from the, the lynching of George Floyd. The height of the summer, the entire country was brought together um, with, the, with the urgent need to do something different in public safety. Sentiment is drifting from that, particularly from our white neighbors. Um, uh, so. Uh, while these these acts are coming before uh, are being entered before Congress, we got to keep the pressure on outside of that because it's ultimately activists and organizers that are going to make sure that this stuff gets done. So if you're listening to this and that applies to you, or even if it doesn't, consider supporting your local organizers and activists because we're seeing it slip outside of consciousness, and we can't afford to do that. When I talk to the folks who are survivors, whose whose family members have died, the worst thing is losing the family member, and the second thing is when everybody forgets. So, with that, again, want to thank uh, that the bill is here, that we got to be here, um, and looking forward to a brighter tomorrow. Thanks so much, everyone.